Hello, I'm Alex and welcome to the History Chronicles. If you like our work then please don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you'd like to support the channel in return for exclusive perks, please visit our Patreon page. Now, on with the video. What was important about the Sutton Hoo burial site? And who was buried there? Let's find out in today's episode of the History Chronicles. Today's History Chronicle begins in 1939. The location is a field on a piece of high ground overlooking the River Devon estuary, near to the town of Woodbridge in Suffolk, England. Amateur archaeologist Basil Brown, hired to excavate the burial mounds rising from the ground by landowner Edith Pretty, dug into the Suffolk soil to reveal perhaps the greatest archaeological discovery in English history and the richest intact early medieval grave in all of Europe. The Sutton Hoo burial has enhanced our understanding of Anglo-Saxon England immensely, and is a rare window into a world that is shrouded in mystery and legend. It is captivating, fascinating and haunting, and in today's video we will delve into what made the find so unique. The site of Sutton Hoo was a communal burial ground, as there are 18 mounds within the grounds, however the majority have been eroded over the centuries and robbed, mostly in the 16th and 17th centuries. Two mounds remained intact, and luckily one of these was the greatest burial of them all, known as the Great Ship Burial or King's Mound. The burial consists of a 90 foot long ship with a burial chamber at the heart of the ship, and in the chamber was placed the body of a great warrior, very possibly a king, along with a host of treasures and possessions. The burial is thought to date from the late 6th or early 7th century, the very heart of what we might call the Dark Ages in England. The timber from the ship had completely eroded when the mound was unearthed. However, the outline of the vessel is still clear from the imprint that has been left in the soil. In addition, the iron planking rivets were still in their original positions. This great ship must have been dragged from the River Devon up to the top of the hill on which the mounds are located, a substantial undertaking that would have taken dozens of men to achieve. The most remarkable feature of Sutton Hoo, however, was the burial chamber that was found in the heart of the faded ship. Here the body of the mysterious inhabitant of the grave had completely disappeared, but the remarkable treasures that were accompanying him on his journey to the afterlife remained intact when the chamber was discovered in 1939. The items that were discovered included coins, jewellery, bowls, plates, armour, weapons, and most famous of all, the remains of a helmet. The bowls and spoons that were found were made of silver, and likely originated from the Byzantine Empire, as did an immense silver platter, with stamps showing that it was made in Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, likely in the 6th century. In addition to this silver, the burial contained a decorated purse with dozens of gold coins originating from mints across Francia, modern-day France, and the coins were vital in enabling historians to be able to date the burial to the early 7th century. The presence of such Byzantine and Frankish treasure within the burial highlights the extent to which early medieval East Anglia had substantial links to the continent and beyond. Both trading links and, due to the fact that the treasures were found in the burial chamber of a prominent leader or king, political links as well. This was eye-opening to historians, who often assumed that the English kingdoms in this period were isolated and unable to maintain links to regions beyond the island of Britain let alone possess hordes of treasure and coins from across Europe and the Middle East. Perhaps the most beautiful treasures were the intricately crafted gold belt buckle, which contained the carvings of numerous animals interwoven with one another, likely crafted in Anglo-Saxon England, as well as two shoulder clasps, a purse lid and an ornate belt. The latter three treasures were made with gold and dark red garnets and demonstrate the immense wealth of the individual buried in the mound at Sutton Hoo. These treasures are all characteristically Germanic in their style and design, particularly with the appearance of animals and beasts carved in a loose and interwoven fashion so that they appear all over the objects. Aligning oneself with animals and beasts was seen as a source of strength and power, and although the exact details of the pagan religion practiced by the Anglo-Saxons in the post-Roman period are not known, it is evident that animals played a large part in pagan rituals and sacrifices and thus the presence of beasts on armour and jewellery was likely an expression of spiritual and mystical power as well as strength in battle. The presence of animals and beasts is also found on the shield that was discovered at Sutton Hoo. 
the most elaborate shield to survive from the Anglo-Saxon period. Whilst the original wooden board has faded, the metal rim and the gold and garnet decorations have survived and depict a large predatory bird, as well as a dragon. One of the most curious objects found in the burial was a stone scepter, on which are carved four human faces at each end of the scepter. At the top of one end of this scepter, there is a large metallic ring upon which is mounted a stag made of copper alloy. This object is a whetstone, which was used to sharpen blades. However, the elaborate features of this whetstone make it an object which some have speculated had some kind of ceremonial or even religious function. The object could also suggest that the body buried within the ship was a king, as in the early Germanic world, the feature of the stag symbolised strength and had regal connotations, and its presence atop the whetstone strongly suggests that the owner of the scepter was a ruler of some kind. What is clear from the burial, however, is that the great leader beneath the king's mound was a warrior, and whilst this is no surprise considering leaders in early medieval northern Europe were almost exclusively warriors of some kind, the magnificence of this particular warrior is clearly expressed through the artefacts found in the chamber. We've already touched upon the great shield that was found, but the remains of a sword were also discovered at Sutton Hoo, still within its scabbard, lying next to where the body would have lain. Whilst the metal of the sword blade itself has rusted and decayed, the golden and garnet infused top of the handle has preserved. And this has allowed Sue Brunning, curator of the early medieval European collections at the British Museum, to argue that substantial wear on one side of the sword handle suggests that the owner of the sword rested his hand upon this side of the sword when it was attached to his belt, leading to the conclusion, based on the fact that the more decorated side of the handle would have faced outwards, that the owner of this sword was left-handed. That we can know such an intimate detail about the man buried at Sutton Hoo opens the question as to who exactly this person was. A question we will return to shortly. Before then, however, let us examine perhaps the most famous and iconic object to have come from early medieval England, the Sutton Hoo helmet. The helmet, when it was uncovered in 1939, did not look as it does today on display at the British Museum, as it had shattered into fragments. However, the fragments were carefully preserved and pieced together to form the helmet as we know it today. Although the original would likely have been a gleaming silver helmet, teeming with designs and carvings. The helmet was designed to cover the face and head of the wearer, and forms two eye holes which glare out darkly at the observer. Perhaps this has helped to lend the helmet its iconic status, as it seems almost alive. In the historical period where so little is known and material evidence is so sparse, this face from a lost age stares darkly and fiercely at us, reminding us that the early Anglo-Saxon world was very much real and alive to those who were living in it. And one cannot help but wonder if the shock that one experiences today staring at the helmet was also felt 1400 years ago on a battlefield. The helmet follows the Germanic design pattern spoken of earlier, by having plenty of animal and beastly imagery adorning it. This is seen most clearly in the metallic serpent creature that runs along the top of the helmet, coming down to have its wings form the eyebrows of the helmet, and its tail the moustache. These two serpent-like beasts that run along the centre and the top of the helmet were clearly made to inspire fear. A close examination of the helmet from the side will see that these beasts are baring their teeth as if to threaten. The helmet also features boar motifs, and this is a common theme throughout the Anglo-Saxon age, as two other surviving helmets from this period also contain boar features, and the old English poem Beowulf describes helmets that contain depictions of boars and are impenetrable because of these boar images. The eyebrows of the helmet are lined with garnets. However, interestingly, the garnets above one of the eyes are lined with gold foil reflectors, so in the sunlight it would seem as if this eye is glinting and gleaming. The fact that these reflectors are absent from one eye could be a reference to the one-eyed god of pagan mythology, Woden, or as he is better known by his Norse name, Odin. Woden, or Odin, was a prominent god in Germanic paganism and in Scandinavian polytheism, to which the Germanic religion is closely linked. Odin is the chief of the gods. The helmet may therefore be associating the wearer with the god Woden by giving him the appearance of having one glinting eye, linking this ruler with spiritual power and intimidating his enemies. The original helmet would have been covered with detailed designs, and from the helmet fragments archaeologists have been able to recover and recreate most of these images that would have originally adorned the helmet. These designs show warriors trampling their enemies in a Roman style, 
as well as more unique depictions of figures wearing horned headgear and engaging in ritualistic processes. The Sutton Hoo helmet demonstrated the interconnectedness of the North Sea world, in that its closest stylistic parallels are not to be found in England, but in Uppsala, a region of remarkable archaeological discoveries in eastern Sweden. Multiple helmets discovered within ship burials in Uppsala have strikingly similar designs to the Sutton Hoo helm, prompting some theories which suggest that the helmet was made in Sweden. Even if this was not the case, it is clear that there were close links between Sweden and the Kingdom of East Anglia, which is unsurprising considering that the Sutton Hoo mounds stand on the banks of a river which lead right out across the North Sea towards Scandinavia. Interestingly, the Sutton Hoo and Uppsala helmets also have stylistic parallels with helmets of the late Roman Empire, suggesting that northern mercenaries may have fought in Roman ranks in the 5th century before bringing back Roman-style designs for their homelands. Having examined the contents of the burial, we must now ask ourselves the all-important question. Who was the warrior buried in the Great Ship Burial? We do not and perhaps will never have a definitive answer to this question. Nevertheless, the likeliest candidate is Redwald of East Anglia, king of the East Anglians and the most powerful ruler in England in the early 7th century. Redwald ruled from around 599 to 624, and in the course of his reign he defeated the Northumbrian king Ethelfrith and installed Edwin on the throne of Northumbria. After this great triumph in 616, Redwald was at the height of his power, and the Venerable Bede, writing over 100 years later, stated that he held imperium over the southern Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, whilst the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle acknowledged Redwald as Brethwalder, meaning a king with authority over all the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Redwald was also the first ruler of East Anglia to convert to Christianity, although he did not do this wholeheartedly. There is evidence that he maintained two altars next to each other, one dedicated to the pagan gods and one to Christ. Redwald is such a likely candidate because his lifetime matches the date of the Sutton Hoo treasures, and the extravagance and wealth of the burial suggests that its occupant must have been immensely powerful. As well as this, Redwald was not just a king of the East Angles, but seemingly the most powerful king in all of Anglo-Saxon England. There are other theories for this mysterious figure whose body has decayed beneath the boat, such as other East Anglian kings or princes, or a wealthy visitor to Suffolk. Nevertheless, Redwald's case seems to be the most compelling, and the burial is certainly one that is fit for a king. You have been watching the History Chronicles. We'd love to know what you think of the Sutton Hoo burial site. Please let us know below, and if you enjoyed our video, please give us a like and subscribe. It really helps us out. Also, if you'd like to support our work going forward, please visit our Patreon page. And we look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of the History Chronicles.